Good afternoon and welcome to today's event on natural disaster assessing the Jones Act's impact on Puerto Rico. My name is Colin Grabo and I am a policy analyst here at the Cato Institute's Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies. For most of my time here at Cato, I've been working on a project called the uh, Jones Act Reform, uh, Project for Jones Act Reform. Officially launched last year, the project's first major deliverable, an opening salvo, if you will, was a policy analysis released last June which sought to provide an overview of the Jones Act and its many costs and flaws. Since then, we've published any number of uh, op-eds and blog posts, around 30 by my count, and have more policy analyses on the way. The next such policy analysis to be released will take a comprehensive look at the law's economic costs that go just beyond the increased cost of shipping, but also look at other effects such as increased congestion, lost productivity, and the fact that our trading partners keep their markets more closed to our exports than would otherwise be the case in retaliation for the Jones Act. Uh, other papers set for release this year will look at the law's environmental consequences, as well as assess the merits of its national security justification or lack thereof. Beyond these already released and forthcoming papers, we also have podcasts and videos about the Jones Act, and I invite all of you to look, the, look at those, including one that was recently released about the bizarre phenomenon of cattle ranchers in Hawaii placing their cows aboard airplanes to ship them to the West Coast as a direct result of the increased cost of shipping due to the Jones Act. We also have a monthly newsletter, the Jones Act Gazette, which is basically a monthly roundup of our latest writings and activities around the Jones Act as, those, as well as those of others. Um, and all of this can be found at a dedicated Jones Act webpage, cato.org slash Jones Act. This brings me to today's event. For months, we've had internal discussions here about our desire to do an event solely focused on the Jones Act's impact on Puerto Rico. Uh, because it's such a big part of the Jones Act discussion. I think it's impossible to have a discussion about the Jones Act and not talk about Puerto Rico. Finally, we're able to pull together what I think is an excellent group of speakers, as well as an outstanding moderator who I'd now like to introduce. Ann Kruger is a senior research professor of international economics at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. She's also a senior director of the Center for International Development, of which she is the founding director and the Harold L. and Caroline Rich Emeritus Professor of Sciences and Humanities in the Economics Department at Stanford University. And Kruger was first Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund from 2001 to 2006. And uh, before that, she taught at Stanford and Duke Universities. From 1982 to 1986, she was Vice President for Economics and Research at the World Bank. Professor Kruger is a distinguished fellow and past president of the American Economic Association, a senior research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Econometric Society, and the American Philosophical Society. Perhaps most importantly, Anne is no stranger to Puerto Rico, having led a team several years ago which authored a report on Puerto Rico's economy at the request of the Commonwealth's government. Also note that she wrote an excellent column about the Jones Act earlier this month that I invite everyone to check out if they have not already do so, done so. Please join me in welcoming today's moderator, Ann Kruger. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Before I introduce our speakers, uh, I just want to say a couple of words. The main thing I want to say is I actually have a disagreement with Colin because he says it's Puerto Rico that you can't Discuss. I think the Jones Act is detrimental in many ways. Certainly Puerto Rico and Hawaii and other islands are among them, but it does more damage to the U.S. economy on the mainland uh, than is normally thought about. We think about Puerto Rico even though we don't necessarily do what we should, but we do think about it. Whereas what happens on the mainland is something else, and the fact that we do not have the kind of water shipping that we should have is a function also of the Jones Act. And please don't forget that just because you hear about uh, the fact that it should be repealed simply because of Puerto Rico, which it should, but there are other reasons too. Uh, anyway, just to back up a bit, Puerto Rico has been in, 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 in the slump for a long time. You can call it stagnation, you can call it a slump. What you cannot call it accurately is a recession. It has gone on too long and it has been too structural and not amenable to Keynesian cures. It was thought to be a recession, so for years the legislature approved balanced budgets, in quotes, which I'm sure they believed were budget, balanced budgets, but which did not turn out that way. They turned out instead to be budgets that were in deficit, as a result of which Puerto Rico got itself into great trouble 
Uh, and that's, I think, a part of what I want to say. The other part of that one is, and it's important, uh, that it's a, it's a sad situation in the following way. If you ask, has Puerto Rico done things to make things better for itself? By and large, I would argue that many of the things Puerto Rico has done has made it worse. Has the United States government, Congress, done things that help Puerto Rico? By and large, they have made it worse. Uh, the result of which is that each group, the Congress and Puerto Rico, can, can blame the other for what's going wrong and say, well, they need to change that, which is true, but they forget that they need to change it too. So what we're talking about today is one of the things uh, that happens to Puerto Rico because of something the U.S. does that is clearly discriminatory. Uh, the Jones Act does not apply, for example, to the Dominican Republic right next door, and that makes their energy and other things much cheaper. And I could go on, but I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that later. But there are things the U.S. government does beyond the Jones Act that are uh, difficult, too. And, but the Jones Act is the one we are going to concentrate on uh, today. The Jones Act has been with us for 99 years. I think 100 through would be a wonderful time to get rid of it. <laughs> it's, not, it's outlasted any usefulness it may ever have had, if it ever had any. And it has been costly, obviously, to many people, except possibly the shipping companies that have had a quasi-monopoly or oligopoly among them. So with that, let me turn and let me introduce first uh, our first speaker, who is the Lieutenant Governor of uh, the state of Puerto Rico. And uh, two years now, is it? Yes. Yeah, right, two years. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Lieutenant Governor Rivera Marin is our first speaker, and he's going to tell us how it looks like from the trenches. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon to you all. It's truly a privilege to share a panel with uh, such distinguished uh, co-panelists, and I want to thank the Cato Institute for promoting this conversation and uh, for promoting uh, what uh, for us brings surprises. I've heard stories uh, about the effect of uh, Jones Act in different uh, economies and, and different jurisdictions. I heard about uh, the effect it has had in bringing uh, road salt to New Jersey in the past. Uh, I never heard about flying cows uh, as a, a, an effect uh, with Hawaii. But certainly for, for Puerto Rico, uh, we, we, uh, we've had a, uh, an effect in terms of, uh, since Puerto Rico they, as an island, uh, the only way we can bring in uh, commodities and, uh, and basic resources, which was magnified re just recently after Hurricane Maria and Irma, is to, through uh, our ship lanes and, and airports. Certainly, um, we, uh, we have reviewed many, many studies, including uh, Ms. Kruger's report on Puerto Rico, where the effect of the Jones Act on shipping costs is highlighted. At the end, it's the consumer that, that, uh, that uh, takes care of all this burden, and it's through the cost that it's affected. Before being um, um, my, in my tenure in state for the last two years, uh, I, I was a, a, the director for tourism for the island, and before that, uh, I was an energy regulator. And I can recall what happened and the origins of the Jones Act as a means to protect uh, the, the maritime industry in, in, uh, during war times. And uh, you must review the effect of price controls and the Office of Price Control led by, by John Kenneth Galbraith at that time. What we did when we allowed the markets to work in, in, in the energy side, it was that the prices were lowered. Right now, we have, a, uh, a, we have filed a petition to get a condition waiver for the transport of LNG from the mainland, from the Gulf states, to Puerto Rico. As, as Ms. Kroger just uh, highlighted, I, I, was, uh, I had a meeting uh, just uh, last week with uh, Danilo Medina, the Dominican Republic president, and his uh, industry uh, ministers, and they are they bring and they source their LNG from the terminals in the Gulf Coast. And they do get a lower price and, uh, and they realize savings that are translated and uh, they, the, the costs that the hotels, that the industry, and that the families and households pay in the Dominican Republic. It's, uh, there's no way you can harmonize that reality whereby we as a U.S. territory, we don't have access. It's, um, 
So it's a well-known fact. If you look at the joint uh, task force report from Congress just uh, back in December of 2016, the, the conclusion is Puerto Rico needs to transition to natural gas. The Department of Energy, on the same token, uh, that's the advice, transition to natural gas. We've done our part. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the governor um, signed into law a major energy reform whereby we are concessioning transmission and distribution of energy in the island, and we are engaging in uh, public-private partnerships for the production of energy in the island. Actually, one of such projects have already awarded whereby uh, units five and six in San Juan will be producing energy with natural gas. But we are entering into contracts, and we want to purchase that gas from the U.S. mainland. At, at the moment, we source our gas from Trinidad, Tobago. Uh, mainly, we source energy from uh, ports like Estonia, Russia, uh, and... Uh, if U.S. public policy is to promote energy independence and promote national security by such independence, Puerto Rico is part, it's, it's the third border, it's the Caribbean border of the United States. So um, we believe that through our petition whereby we are promoting a condition waiver. So as long as there, no, there is no U.S. flag vessel uh, allow to carry natural gas from U.S. ports that we can uh, use um, foreign flat vessels. And that's public policy because uh, through the uh, Passenger Vessels Act, while there are no cruise ships built in the U.S. shipyards, foreign flat cruise ships are allowed currently to serve to U.S. ports. And uh, our cruise ship industry is flourishing because of that possibility. On the same token, public policy in the U.S. allows merchant marine uh, from the, the, the academy to work in foreign flags, LNG vessels, so they get their training. So our petition is completely aligned with U.S. public policy in terms of allowing uh, uh, those forces of the market to work. Critics say that that will cost U.S. jobs. Jobs in Puerto Rico are also U.S. jobs. It's, it's, it's a point that we need to stress. If we, if we, if we have an aspiration that uh, there should be energy independence, that includes the island, and that should be incorporated into public policy. On the same token, Puerto Rico, as Ms. Kruger just uh, detailed, has gone through through years of economic stagnation. Certainly the energy input is one of such as detailing in reports. If you take the period from 2005 to 2015, the US average is close to 11 cents per kilowatt hour. Our average is 20 cents, and it has peaked to more than 30 cents. That's triple. That's truly a burden in our economy. It doesn't allow Puerto Rico to be competitive. It doesn't allow Puerto Rico to build jobs. And we rely in, on industries that are critical for, for the mainland. Just recently, after Hurricane Maria, when you talk about national security, there was a major disruption because of our, our energy system, which relies on fossil fuels, uh, on bunker fuel that, that, that is not friendly to the environment, that is not cost efficient. So we, as people with a spiritual, we want to transition to LNG, but we want to do it with American source energy sources. Um, today, we were just talking about the, the, the geopolitics uh, and the risk and the, uh, and the natural security in issues. Uh, last year, you have Maduro signing an agreement with, uh, with Trinidad's uh, prime minister calling for, for, for the source of uh, and providing LNG to uh, Trinidad refineries to, to allow them a higher capacity to their hibiscus platform. So, and today you have a major uh, 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 disruption in terms of, of the, pol the local politics in Venezuela where, 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 
where people are on the streets with arms as we speak. So is that Petro Caribe uh, policy one that Puerto Rico, uh, that the United States wants, wants Puerto Rico to enter? Do, does the $2 billion our public utility uh, company pays in purchasing fuel wants to, should we turn those into rubles or dollars to the US so we promote jobs in the terminals? So we allow LNG to come into the island through a foreign flag vessel condition that there is a, an American built ship that the market forces. You know, I still believe in the invisible hand of, hand of Adam Smith, whereby the market forces allow that competition. In the meantime, like it happens in the cruise ship, allow us to tap into the LNG market whereby there are terminals that have the capacity where we can have a reliable, cost-efficient source of clean fuel so Puerto Rico can flourish, shine, and prosper. That is the case we have brought up before uh, the, Homeland, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense. Allow Puerto Rico to become competitive. Everybody agrees that we need to transition into NLG. Let's do it with American gas. Let's build American jobs in Puerto Rico, in the terminals, and that should be the, the, the net effect of this initiative. So certainly, uh, Jones Act, it hinders our capacity to, to develop our economy, to allow our households to have clean, cost-efficient, and uh, sustainable energy sources. And it hurts me that I speak with my counterpart, um, Miguel Vargas, uh, 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 the foreign minister in the Dominican Republic, said, I get my gas from, from, from the Chenin Pass, from the Gulf, and I cannot do so. So there, the, the effect could be in disruption. Puerto Rico manuf it's manufactured more, more drugs and, and, and medical devices than any country or any state for the US. And we saw critical, um, we call um, major logistic disruptions in the health market. We have Northcom, Southcom uh, presence. We have DEA. We are part of, the, uh, of a corridor where many of the opioids and drugs go through and come to the market. All those helicopters, all those uh, 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 assets require American source uh, energy. And uh, through this um, waiver, to the Jones Act, where we can uh, access LNG from American ports, Puerto Rico's future is brighter. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll come back, I'm sure, with questions and more discussion later. Uh, but before we do that, we have uh, more to hear. And our next uh, participant is Vincente Feliciano, uh, who is now president of, uh, let me find the name, Advantage Business Consulting, which he's been doing uh, for some time when we were doing uh, the Puerto Rico report four or five years ago now, uh, Vincente was one of our best and most helpful uh, sources and guides in the whole thing, and I'm pleased to see him coming here and helping again. Thank you, Vincente. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, I was told I could use, yes, great. Ah. I was told I could use the podium, and I, I was told I had seven minutes, so we're going <laughs> to uh, work within that uh, constraint. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Manuel Reyes, among the people that I know, because Manuel was instrumental in getting uh, the research that we perform and John, the research that John performed off the ground. Um, those two pieces of research uh, were game changers in the sense that up to that point, the US government and the Puerto Rico government realized that there was a major burden related to the Jones Act on Puerto Rico. However, they both at least claim that they didn't know how to uh, assess it, that there was no data to, to ascertain how big it was. So uh, that was the contribution of these two research pieces. Our, our research, we use a database of some 40,000 containers. That's about 15% of the containers uh, arriving to Puerto Rico in a nine-month period. And our figure was that it cost, after uh, standardizing for container size and nautical miles, it cost 
151%, two and a half times the cost of international shipping. Jones Act, two and a half times international shipping. Now, we validated our work with some previous work by the U.S. Department of Transportation. So the Department of Transportation stated it's 2.7 times. We had 2.5, <laughs> uh, 170%, 151%. So, so that made us quite comfortable that uh, our figures were in the ballpark of uh, somebody else's effort. And uh, this really makes the claim of the Jones Act shippers that they don't increase the cost of transportation rather a, a, a shameful uh, proposition. Now, I would like to, to uh, stop a bit here, is that when you, we talk about Jones Act, we think about uh, maritime transportation. Actually, the differences in land transportation are huge between international shippers and uh, Jones Act shippers, because only Puerto Rico is serviced through only four ports from the U.S. by Jones Act shippers. And 90% of the containers come from one port, Jacksonville. So if a ship comes from Europe with 10,000 containers, docks in Miami, 200 containers are going to Puerto Rico, you have to put those containers on trucks and drive them to Jacksonville. It adds to uh, the transportation cost. Now, what if they come from California? Well, you have to get them across the continent to mostly Jacksonville. Now, it costs 7,000 bucks to transport a container from California to Jacksonville. Then you add the 2,400 to San Juan. We had the data to do the benchmarks, and, the, and that was the beauty of our, of our analysis. We, we, we had actual data from importers. And we, we thought that Chile was a good benchmark. Similar distance from California to San Juan, they both have to go through the Panama Canal. It costs $2,500 to get a container from Chile to San Juan. So the cost of using Jones Act shipping to get a container from California to San Juan is almost four times the cost of international shipping. Now, uh, recently, one importer of Puerto, of Puerto Rico, uh, Pan American Grain, they were fine because they were using the label of California rice on their product. Turns out that they were bringing rice from China. They were bringing uh, rice originally from California, but some of it they switched to China. So, and one of the reasons is transportation costs. <laughs> so right now, Puerto Rico imports rice from China, wheat from Canada, gasoline from Europe, natural gas from Trinidad because of the Jones Act. And those are US jobs. Um, by the same token, much of the US represents major transportation costs as markets. It's very difficult for a manufacturer in Puerto Rico to access the California market because of these transportation costs. So the Puerto Rico economy is not as uh, entwined to the US economy, partly because of the Jones Act. Now, the number of, of uh, port service, four, it used to be 10, it's down to four. These are the 10 ships that took advantage of the uh, exemption to the Jones Act during the post-hurricane uh, period. Now, um, it, it, was in, it, was, it is worth noting that at a time when people were literally dying, when some ORs went black because they didn't have electricity and the diesel ran out, the Jones Act shippers lobbied against uh, an exemption. If an exemption was granted 10 days. During those 10 days, you had to find the merchandise, find a, an available ship, get it to port, and load it to qualify. 10 ships qualify. They brought life-saving products, such as generators, 
gasoline, diesel, baby food, water, etc. But uh, what is interesting is that out of the nine, only one came from a port that is currently serviced by Jones Act carriers. In other words, the cost of land transportation is a major cost for, uh, of the Jones Act to Puerto Rico. And I would like to end by a quote from a world-renowned economist, Dr. Arn Krieger. Uh, <laughs> this, this, this gal said, exempting Puerto Rico from the U.S. Jones Act could significantly reduce transport costs and open up new sectors for future growth. In no mainland state does the Jones Act have so profound an effect on the cost structure as in Puerto Rico. Furthermore, there are precedents for exempting islands, notably the U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Our third speaker is John Dunham, who is president of John Dunham Associates, which is a consulting firm. Uh, he works on a lot of public policy issues and has worked on some of the things with the Port Authority of New York and others relative to transport. John. Thank you, Dr. Kruger. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm, I'm suffering from terrible allergies, so I apologize uh, right up front. And I want to thank Cato, and I want to thank uh, uh, Maya and Manuel for uh, allowing us to do this uh, presentation and this research. Um, the Jones Act is a very interesting law. It's, it's 100 years old, 99 years old. It's close to we'll right? Round it up. Round it up. <laughs> round it up. And it was, it was promoted by a senator in Washington State named Wesley Jones in 1920. And the purpose of the, uh, his, his purpose so it's not stated in the act, was really for the Port of Seattle to control the trade between the mainland United States and what was then the territory of Alaska. And he, they, they've done that. They've also had a, a huge number of unintended consequences because of this cabotage law. Not only for Puerto Rico, for Hawaii, and for Alaska, but mainly actually for the mainland United States. Am I not working? Can you hear me if I'm not working? <laughs> I'm getting. <laughs> Am I working now? You're working all right. It's just they're not listening <laughs> to you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, okay. Am I working now? No. Am I working now? Oh, I can hear. <laughs> I can hear Sorry about that. Hopefully, you heard the history of the Jones Act there. <laughs> um, the problem, the problem, though, with, uh, with, with dealing with the Jones Act is that, like all regulations, all regulations, uh, regulations against robbery, regulations against pollution, re cabotage regulations, they're all, they're all built and they all have winners and losers. In the case of the Jones Act, the winners are those uh, companies that are, like, that are lucky enough to, to own the 96 uh, Jones Act vessels, and the losers tend to be everybody else. The problem is that to get a law changed requires a huge effort. To get something passed in Washington, as we all know, requires a monstrous lift. To keep something the same requires almost no lift. And that's what's happened over the last 100 years. People have been losing out because of this, even though uh, there, are, there are winners that continue to promote it. And it's, it's been a massive failure. When, when the Jones Act was enacted in 1920, the United States fleet accounted for about 25% of the, of the international shipping tonnage. Today, it's less than one half of 1%. There's virtually no US flag fleet anymore. And as I mentioned, there are only 96 or 97 Jones Act eligible, eligible ships. And about 2 thirds of those are going between uh, Alaska and the mainland United States carrying oil. There, there's virtually no US Jones Act fleet. Now, simple economics. I've, I've been studying economics for a long time, and there's this guy named Adam Smith back in, uh, in Scotland a long, long time ago that, that came up with this idea of supply and demand, right? If you have a lot of supply the, for any product, the costs tend to go down. If you reduce supply, the costs tend to rise. So simple economics tells you that when you reduce the number of vessels in the trade, when you reduce the amount of shipping available, costs are going to rise. The problem is identifying what those costs are. And, and how they affect any economy. Because there's really no, there's no easy data available. This isn't something I can just go out and grab some data from the BLS and you know, do some you know, magical mumbo jumbo with and, and wow, I have an answer. This is something that requires very, very complex and detailed modeling to, to come up with. So we built a study 
around a bunch of assumptions because I really don't have real data. Nobody does. But we use a, a number of different assumptions. The first thing we did was we built a base case. We built an analysis of what international freight rates were to Puerto Rico. And we did this across the entire economy. We did about 200 products uh, that, that we used in this model. And that, and that model gives us our baseline. To ship internationally to Puerto Rico, it costs X dollars per container or X dollars per ton for each commodity. And then we shocked that system with, with seven, really seven different assumptions. Again, there's no real data. We used what we could get. We, we, we picked up some, uh, some quotes from freight forwarders for FAK rates, freight all kind rates, and used the difference between those rates and, and our international shipping rates as one of our assumptions. We used all of the studies that have been produced since 1960, I think, is when this really started getting looked at, uh, to come up with another differential. We came up with a number um, that actually the, the shipper, the, the, the steamship lines, kind of goofed and, and allowed to be released in one of their reports. It actually gave us the shipping cost for soup. We used that as an example. Um, we, used, uh, we used the survey that, 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 that you all did. Uh, we used an average of all of those. We used differentials uh, in um, chartering costs because those we could get. And, uh, and then we used a, an, an agglomeration that was all of our, you know, what we thought was the best assumption. We shocked the system with those. And we came up with what the differential in cost would be for shipping. Add to that the transportation, uh, the uh, wholesaling retailing margins. We were able to take all 200 of those products and come up with a price differential in Puerto Rico resulting from those increased shipping costs. We took all of those through the entire production process. So we started with oil, converted oil to energy, energy to providing uh, hotel services throughout the entire economy. And the model, as one would expect, came up with higher costs and uh, job losses for the island no matter what scenario we used. Uh, the lowest cost was about $150 per resident uh, for the Jones Act. That was the, the steamship lines number. And that led to about 5,000 lost jobs. 5,000 jobs that would exist in Puerto Rico were the Jones Act not there. The largest cost was about $275, I'm sorry, $375 per resident on the island. And that resulted in about 15, 16,000 lost jobs. Now this is a model. All, most economics is models. We don't, you know, it's very hard. Even if we're looking at census data, it's, it's survey data. It's very, very hard to come up with the actual, actual numbers. But we have a good range, and that range is all negative. And that range all affects the economy of Puerto Rico throughout the entire production process. It's not just one thing. It's, it's not just consumer costs. It's, it's all the business costs to do, to do business on the island. Um, it's open architecture. We can run anything through this. It's, uh, when you do one of these models, the key is not to hide stuff, right? to be open about it, to be open about your assumptions. Somebody can quibble with those assumptions, and we can run a different number. When you see, it, when you see an analysis that's done on, on the Jones Act in Puerto Rico, and there's no data presented, there's no model presented, all, all you're looking at then is somebody's opinion. You're not looking at a real analysis of, of the issue. And, and I want to go back to something that, 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 that the good doctor said. The Jones Act costs Puerto Rico. The Jones Act costs Hawaii. We know that. But the real costs of the Jones Act are in the continental United States. And nobody talks about that. Just think, the busiest highway, the busiest highway corridor in the U.S. is the I-95 corridor, right, from, from Miami up to, uh, up, up, really up to New York and then beyond. This entire corridor is paralleling the Atlantic Ocean, right? There, there's absolutely no reason to be shipping bulk cargo by truck up and down that, up and down that corridor, except for the fact that you can't get ships to move stuff. There's no reason to be shipping containers from, from the Port of New York down to, uh, uh, you know, or up to Providence when you, can, when you can run ships to do that. Shipping by water is the least expensive way to transport products. The Jones Act increases the costs, but more importantly has completely eliminated the ships available to do that. And the, the consequences are, are huge not only in Puerto Rico and not only for the people of Puerto Rico, but for all of us. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. If anyone wants more detail, 
we, we have all the detail available. Thank you. Let me just add a couple of things which just reinforce some of the points that you all have made. Uh, the first one just on the cost to the mainland of all of this. One of the numbers I've seen is that in Europe, which has rivers but no more than continental United States, 40 to 60 percent of goods going between countries goes by water. In the U.S. mainland, one half of one percent. Mm -hmm. And that has to be largely, not entirely, but probably largely Jones Act effect. And it does jam not only the uh, 95 route north and south, it also jams the Pacific route. Five in California is at least as choked as 95, and you get the same kinds of effects because things do not go by ship, even from, let's say, Los Angeles to Seattle and places like that, because it's more expensive uh, than going by truck. On the other hand, without the Jones Act, it would be far cheaper to go by water. So it is not simply a matter of losing a few cents here and there, and all of us are paying for that, not only in the sense that we're citizens and Puerto Rico deserves better, but also just in the sense that in the mainland, uh, we're, it's as if we have a tax on everything we buy that, that comes in by truck and otherwise, and that's almost everything. It is not something that is simply Puerto Rico. And I think it's important to remember that the biggest damage is done there, but not the only damage. Uh, the second kind of comment is that it is astonishing how much of the loss there has been in the merchant marine as a result of the Jones Act. The United States was the third largest in the world, and now we're way off, off the chart and the bottom end, not the top end. And with that, uh, as, I, as was said, jobs were lost and things like that, but the shipbuilding industry itself is going on. Europe has faced the same competitive pressures uh, from the uh, Asia, especially Korea, and, and so on, that, and Japan that we did, uh, or would have, on uh, building ships. The response in Europe was to specialize in the kinds of ships for which it still took skills and which was still a good thing. In the US, there's been no change, uh, just our relative costs have gone up, and this is my last comment. Uh, the numbers I've seen say that the cost of building the same ship here as you might build uh, anywhere in, in the a Asia, in particular, the low-cost countries, is probably about five and a half, six times what it is there. So first you get the very high-cost ships. Then you get all of this business, of course, of they've got to hire all-American uh, crew for national security reasons. Why? Well, we don't trust foreigners in our ports. We have foreigners in our ports the whole time because, of course, they come in on ships coming from Europe and elsewhere. It makes no sense uh, to talk about things this way. Uh, so many of the arguments are simply the lobbying, I think, of the uh, shipbuilders who want to maintain what they're doing in a comfortable, cozy, protected environment. But meanwhile, the number of ships has gone down and I think it's stated, I couldn't prove it and give you a source, but I heard that the average safe life of a ship is about, an economic life of a ship, about 20 years. Average right. aims of the Jones ship fleet is 35 years, which tells you there's a lot more danger and a lot less modern technology, communications, and so forth than there would otherwise be. The costs go on and on. It's really hard to imagine, but let me now give each of you just a, a chance to respond to comments others have made, and then I'll open it up for the floor. And let's just go in the same order so we can go start done with you, Governor. I, I certainly agree that, that the preferred uh, shipping method is uh, it's through uh, the sea trade and, and, and sea shipping lanes. And that fact, uh, the fact that the artificial barriers uh, are caused by Jones Act limitations uh, uh, exacerbate the fact, it's exacerbated by the fact that in, on the energy side, um, the pipelines are, you know, to capacity. So uh, oil, uh, oil byproducts and natural gas, um, the capacity of the pipelines moving in throughout the continental U.S. Uh, are over, over capacity. And, uh, and then that preferred uh, method by chipping is not allowed because of the, the fleet's uh, limitation that was uh, detailed here. So w certainly uh, the fact that those chips are not available are, are, are a, a, a burden and, and, a, and have an, an effect of what we pay, pay for, for the energy prices. It's curious that the industry pro it says that they have alternatives and they're talking about uh, new con uh, vessels that, that they're 40 foot ISO containers that carry a limited amount. And we did model uh, that alternative and uh, it would mean that Puerto Rico for just 
uh, our two units in San Juan 5 and 6 that have been transitioned to LNG, we will, have, we will need 27,000 of these containers, making 519 round trips a year. And there's no <laughs> ships that have that capacity. So uh, the disruption in logistics is major. And when I hear the effect it has on, on family, the cost on the families, the jobs that it costs, it's certainly, um, we model the, the, the price differential of uh, being able to access uh, natural gas at the spot prices in the Gulf, and that would cost more than 300 millions to the, our utility company. So um, the job and the uh, income and opportunities that are lost because of the inefficiencies uh, created by, by this uh, artificial barrier or protectionist measure uh, certainly is costing Puerto Rico dire. Thank you. Cindy? Oh, uh, two quick things. One, John's uh, figures are strictly based on difference in maritime transportation costs. They do not incorporate the issue of land transportation costs. Uh, in addition, uh, because the Puerto Rico economy is hampered by the Jones Act, Puerto Rico needs more transfer payments from uh, the federal government on an ongoing basis than would be the case if you allow, if, if, the, if the Jones Act is repealed and we can be more competitive and have more jobs and, and do more things by ourselves. So a lot of the requests for federal transfers are the result of, look, this problem. Thank you. I think there's some good points that have been raised, uh, to Dr. Cruz's point. The, the Jones Act has really hampered the U.S. economy. And one, one thing to look at is that the administration has just put tariffs on imported steel and aluminum. One of the biggest components of building a ship is, you know what? Steel and aluminum. <clears throat> there are no ships built in the United States now, virtually none. And that has really hurt the steel and aluminum industries in this country. Bethlehem Steel in Pennsylvania specialized in ship steel for ships. Stop building ships, bye-bye Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem Steel. That's a huge uh, cost to uh, places like Bethlehem, Allentown, the, the Susquehanna Valley of, of Pennsylvania. Those are real jobs, those are real people that are affected by this 100-year-old law that nobody even knows about. And, and the, the, the inland transportation cost in the United States is, is really important. We didn't model it because it wasn't our job. That wasn't what no, we were no, asking. No, no, no. No, we're clear about yeah, that. No, we no, no. We're asking. <laughs> we look at what we look at. Uh, we're, we're, we're hired to study. But um, one thing that I've worked on a lot is is um, is is food. The food industry. It's one of our our company's big uh, clients. And one of the things that happens every time there's a harvest season in the United States, particularly for uh, sugar beets and soybeans, is every rail car in the country gets sucked up moving this stuff. And you can't move steel, you can't move scrap, you can't move cars, you can't move general cargo, because everything is chock-a-block full with soybeans or sugar beets. There's just not enough capacity in the rail network to handle all that. Mm -hmm. If you could move more by water, and this is bulk cargo, this is the stuff that moves by water. It's designed, it's, water's the best for handling. Um, if you could move coal by water, all of these things would free up the rail system. That would lower rail prices. That would improve rail service, which is actually abominable throughout the country. And, and these, are all, these are all effects that are caused by something that was designed for the Port of Seattle to control Alaska. <laughs> OK, I guess it's time to open it up for questions. Start with you, sir. Um, on, on LNG, uh, I guess a question. Uh, uh, um, a couple weeks ago... Please we identify a, yourself first. I'm sorry, I should have asked uh, John McCallum with Blue Alpha Capital. Um, uh, the International Gas Union came out with their 2019 annual report. That's the group that uh, uh, measures all the LNG. And two weeks ago, and they had the 2018 data, and that annual report showed that Puerto Rico um, moved 100% uh, of its LNG 
came from Trinidad, and Trinidad, I guess, is the fourth or fifth largest provider, so I guess it was a better deal for Puerto Rico to get it from there than Qatar or Australia, which are the biggest LNG exporters. Um, I guess my question is, that same annual report showed that the DR, which brought in a little bit more LNG than Puerto Rico, brought 85% of their LNG from Trinidad and only 15% from the US. This is 2018. So I guess my question is, how does that uh, square with the, um, uh, I guess, the point that you're making? I mean, it, uh, obviously, the DR is not constrained by the Jones Act. And yet, in 2018, uh, you know, with roughly the same quantity as Puerto Rico, 85% came from the DR. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about LNG, but I, I assume it's somewhat a commodity. Uh, a freight rate uh, kind of affects it. Uh, Trinidad's a fairly big exporter. Um, in fact, I think the data shows that Trinidad's price of LNG in the summer was actually less than the U.S. was getting. Now, I know you get into spot versus long term, but um, I guess I look at that, what I, I assume is correct, that DR uh, last year bought 85% of their LNG from Trinidad. Okay. I think, I think uh, the dynamics, the market dynamics uh, upon the availability of uh, natural gas for export in the uh, mainland is changing very rapidly. And, uh, and, and the capacity and the terminals that are being opened uh, will shall increase the, the, the capacity to serve uh, uh, markets, including the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. So on the, length, on the long term, if you look at uh, similar analysis, you see that uh, we, we will be working on a five-year span probably while we uh, transfer our technology to LNG source of fuel. But at the same time, the Trinidad, for example, when, when we compare U.S. and Trinidad, they, their, their expected uh, capacity, it's dwelling into on a 15-year window. So I guess uh, what we are looking is on a long-term solution for our energy uh, needs. And uh, we've been, I, I, I guess, for the last 50 years dealing with our incapacity to meet energy demands for the island properly. And I think well, our strategies are on a long-term basis and align with the U.S. strategy whereby you are opening more terminals, thus increasing the capacity for U.S. to export. And that's our objective to tap into those market, recognizing a st stable price uh, on, on NLG moving forward and certainly looking at the uh, reliability of uh, the U.S. source. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about the recent statistics, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not pri private to it, but some interesting statistics a couple of years back showed that one of the main suppliers of LNG to Puerto Rico was the Dominican Republic. <laughs> now, there's no LNG produced in the Dominican Republic. At some point, the federal government initiated an investigation of, is, was there a runaround of the Jones Act here? And uh, well, not- The US was actually exporting LNG uh, until fairly recently. Yeah, well, the, after the investigation started, all of a sudden the imports from the DR dried up. And so, that's the statistics of imports of LNG in Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you just answered your question. Up to a few years ago, up to I think three years ago, it was actually virtually illegal to export any petroleum from the United States. I think LNG could only be exported to Japan. So the U.S. didn't have terminals. It didn't have an infrastructure to export LNG. As a matter of fact, gas producers in this country are capping wells, and they're not producing because prices are so darn low. LNG in the United, uh, gas in the United States, uh, the LNG prices are about a quarter of the price in gutter, which is the largest exporter and serves the European market. So terminals are being built, and when terminals are built, then there'll, there'll be shipments. But there was, the Dominican Republic, uh, the, I'm sorry, Trinidad is shipping LNG because it has terminals. The United States, until last year, really didn't have any. Yeah. Okay. So, gentleman over here with his hand up. Thank you. Uh, Max Trujillo from MJT Policy Government Relations Firm here in Washington. 
I today it was just announced that a, a, an idea, a compromise has been reached, at least in principle, between the White House and Congress uh, regarding a two trillion dollar uh, infrastructure project. Um, this sounds like an opportunity for the Jones Act discussion to come into play as it has an impact on infrastructure, particularly in Puerto Rico, but all throughout the ports and rails, as you mentioned, throughout the country. I want this to get your sense of uh, the viability of the debate moving in it from a single issue to a multi-state issue. And what are your, your thoughts on how to overall, how to get the debate moving forward? Thank you. I think that's for you. <laughs> well, personally, I, I've been um, focusing my, my discussion at least on, on where we are moving forward on our petition regarding uh, energy. And, uh, and certainly uh, it has come up that other um, regions of the nation share our, our challenges. And uh, when you, uh, you look at the Northeast, uh, the, uh, it's energy also where, whereby because infrastructure limitations, uh, I, uh, the, 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 there's a, the lack of access when you compare it to other regions and, and that limits the ability to prosper. I would guess um, the, uh, when, 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 when you, we, we look at the globe and, and the global economy and, and the major uh, and investments uh, countries like China uh, is making, certainly, um, we, we truly uh, support uh, the uh, administration's initiative to invest in, in, in repairing our, our, our infrastructure that it's under fatigue and, and to improve it. Uh, so new technologies, new capacities, new sources of uh, energy can be properly tapped and become uh, potential for exports at, that at the end shall uh, make the U.S. more competitive. So we are very optimistic about uh, that policy. Anybody else want to come in? Chanting? I, I think no. regulatory reform, like looking at the Jones Act or, or other regulations, is one way to in increase infra infrastructure capacity without building stuff. Um, so that's something that, that should be part of any infrastructure bill. And also the energy infrastructure, for the most part, the rail infrastructure is, is privately financed. So that's not really a government uh, you're not going to see a lot of government money going into that. Even if you built more seaports, um, you're not going to have more ships to go to them. So that's not going to really do much. Next question. Okay. Nick, right there, sir. You. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Krukoff. I'm uh, with Douglas County, Maryland, which is the future of the District of Columbia. Um, my question to you is about politics also, if you could follow up on what is the administration's official policy on the Jones Act, if there is one. And I just want to make a comment real quick that we are in a bubble and we are receptive to points about increasing the incentives to be capitalistic in this room. But did we invite the delegation from Washington State, the lobbyist that advocates for the Jones Act shippers to this event? We need to get out of our bubbles and advocate and unify. And the, uh, first, the politics, please, if you would comment more thoroughly on Republicans, Democrats, Trump administration, that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Another, I, there was one down here. Sir, two, two over here. First you and then you. First row and then the third row here, right on the corner. Sir, I can't see well enough to see who's who with the lights on us here. <laughs> I, <clears throat> Saw a uh, name, Dave Onspock, no affiliation, retired. I saw on the website about putting that billboard sign over, I guess, on a New an expressway over in New York uh, City, near New York City, uh, uh, Long Island or something like that, about if you're you know, congested on the roadway, blame the Jones Act. Do you know if that had any effect? If there Has there been a popular groundswell against this thing, or is it still, you know, true believers in this room today? <laughs> still, yes, thanks. Except for me, I never saw the billboard, but I actually am a transportation economist. I came out of transportation. I worked for the Port Authority in New York. Um, and the Jones Act is one of those inside baseball things. Nobody knows anything about this law. 
<laughs> Nobody, unless you, unless you like to take cruises to nowhere or something like that, and they, you can't do it now because of the Jones Act, by the way, um, you don't know about this thing. This is total inside baseball, and it's, it's something that's going to have to be done. By, if you're going to change it, you're going to get congressmen and congress ladies to, to care about it. Okay. okay, then the next question, the third row, and then the second row, right? And then I'll get back to the back there. I see your hands. Hello, uh, Rich Madden, uh, full-time merchant mariner, part-time uh, safety and security advocate for the maritime industry. I've actually got multiple questions, and I'm not sure how much freedom I'll have here, but I'd like to, one, challenge a couple of assumptions or a couple of numbers that you've been talking about. The number was thrown out of 96 uh, vessels, and th that's 96 deep draft vessels operating in the Jones Act. It's 96 or 97, yeah. I, I just want to... Uh, emphasize that that's actually close to 40,000 vessels operating in the Jones Act trade. This includes deep sea vessels, tugs and barges, barges work boats. 40, barges. So you have a large number of vessels operating under the Jones Act, which uh, seems a little disingenuous if we only address the 96 or 97. Uh, the other number I want to throw out there or that I want to challenge are the, uh, or the idea of real jobs, real people that Mr. Dunham threw out. The Jones Act statistically uh, adds something like $100 billion to the gross domestic product. Of that $100 billion, $40 billion of that are wages to the 650,000 workers in the Jones Act industry. So you're talking close to $62,000 per Jones Act worker, which is above the median income in the U.S. And according to NPR that I was listening to on the way in today, we're looking for middle class, middle income jobs. We don't have those, they're not being built. So th th those are my challenges to you. I'm really not looking for a response, um, but I will take a look at, well, I mean, you can respond to them if, if you will, but I'd also like to address uh, specifically Puerto Rico and the LNG trade and uh, power down there. Of the 30 cents per kilowatt hour that you're talking about, how much of that is actual energy cost versus infrastructure cost? Because I understand in the wake of Hurricane Irma and uh, Maria, I believe it was, the, there was a lot of damage to the infrastructure in uh, Puerto Rico. So how much of this is the rebuilding versus the actual energy costs? And mostly uh, when you look at the uh, red, rate structure component, um, you have uh, in PREPA the, the largest uh, source of, of operational costs is fuel purchases. And uh, because uh, we rely on uh, bunker fuel in the production of uh, as probably 70% of, of, of our port fuel portfolio, I, uh, that's why everybody, it's a common fact that everybody agrees that we need to transition into LNG in order to be more efficient, be, uh, be able to meet math standards and environmental standards, because Puerto Rico is subject to the same EPA regulations and the same EPA requirements as the rest of the nation. Nevertheless, we don't have access to uh, the cost associated by being able to tap into a cleaner, more efficient, less costly uh, source of energy for our turbines. So uh, when you look at that 30 cents, uh, uh, co uh, the, co the main component is fuel, and it was directly correlated to when the barrel of oil uh, was near $150 per barrel, and at that point in time, we suffered a direct consequence while the LNG uh, uh, cost was not as volatile as, as uh, bunker fuel in our case. Yeah, and I want to take issue about jobs created by the Jones Act. Uh, there are jobs that are tied to the Jones Act, but there are jobs that are lost bec because of the Jones Act. And like I think the three economists in this panel would uh, argue... And the governor. <laughs> the, uh, the loss of jobs more than off offsets the jobs tied to the Jones Act. So the Jones Act uh, diminishes, it subtracts from total employment in the U.S. John? I, sir? Also talking about back to the LNG, back to the jobs, but like, but back on the LNG in Puerto Rico. Uh, the America's Cup Act of 2011 uh, brought in three Jones Act vessels or gave coastwise certifications to three uh, potential LNG vessels, the LNG Gemini, Leo, and Virgo. So this is 2011, eight years ago. 
Currently, two of those ships are laid up in Norway, I believe. Has there been any uh, attempt to use these vessels for importing LNG to Puerto Rico? Uh, my belief is that those are mothballed in, in, uh, in, in the uh, North Sea and that uh, those vessels require the retrofitting and they don't qualify because they are not owned by uh, U.S. companies or nationals, as required by the Young Nats, but my belief is they're owned by the South Korean company. And if they're going to be retrofitted overseas, that can't be done again for the Jones Act reasons new, than used here. Exactly. Because, because of the excise tax, so the overseas retrofitting, Chuck? And I just want to address the, the two points you made about what, what my, my numbers. Uh, I agree with you. There are about 40-some-odd thousand Jones Act qualified vessels. The vast majority of those are trap rock barges, grain barges, tugboats, ferry boats, uh, tenders that are servicing oil wells, not things that are carrying cargo in international type trade. They just, those don't exist. So it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a disingenuous number to use in this discussion. But you are absolutely right, that number is true. Yeah, 40,000 so, 40, is the number I've seen for barges. Yeah, it's mostly barges. Okay, but you're, you're, you're talking about... They're river barges. with containers, with petroleum, with bulk, bulk grain. So to say that it's not happening, to say that we're not taking trucks off the road, again, is a little bit disingenuous. And again, to, 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 to focus yeah. on this, so finish up with the we'll move on. Okay, in terms of traffic on the road, is the, is the congestion on the road, more trucks on the road, is this an effect of the Jones Act, which I expect you'll say it will, it is, or is it an effect of the harbor maintenance tax, which affects all cargo coming on and off vessels in the US? Uh, I've actually written a study against the harbor maintenance tax, which I think okay. is an insane excise tax. The, of course, it's not 100% of the Jones Act. That's a effect. You, you know, if you get rid of the Jones Act tomorrow, there's not going to be no roads on I-95, no, no vehicles on I-95. That's silly. But, but the fact is that, that there are very few vessels in the Jones Act trade that can carry a lot of cargo. You're not going to carry huge amounts of coal on, on you know, river barges. It's, it's, you, know, you, you can carry a lot of coal on a, on a, a bulk freighter. So the cost structure is very different. There and, was a, okay, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll there, was, there was a question further back, right where you're standing. Right there, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kevin Hornberger, state representative for Maryland on the Upper Bay. Uh, one of the things that wasn't discussed is that um, apparently the Jones Act uh, also applies to dredge and dredge spoils. And I was wondering if you could comment on that as we uh, dovetail in with the infrastructure comment that uh, currently uh, dredge spoils are, are applicable to the Jones Act. Wow. I'm, I'm sure they are, right? Because you're going to have to transport between two U.S. ports. So, and, and, and where you are, dredging is extremely important. Can't hear when you don't have the mic. We're in the process in Maryland of creating islands using mm -hmm. dredge spoils from the Port of Baltimore. And um, it's been interpreted that even that is applicable to the Jones Act. So if you could speak to that and, and whether or not it should be repealed yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to bring a foreign vessel in to do that. There was another question just right here in the center, the lady. Hi, Jen Riccardi with the European Union. Um, if you accept that the policy goals of Jones Act are valid, that you want a vibrant merchant marine in the U.S., that you want a shipbuilding industry, are there other better policies that the federal government could be pursuing to encourage the, those policy goals other than the restrictions of Jones Act? You tax and <laughs> you build the, the, the vessel with tax dollars. I mean, you tax a larger economy and you build a vessel with tax dollars. Does that make sense? I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that we do well with, with uh, all the foreign things that we import and all the, the products that we export. In, I mean, I don't think that, that they're valid, the, the objectives. You could achieve them otherwise, but... But then it would be transparent. We, yes. seen, it's much easier to hide things. And, you know. we, have, we have certainly seen a lot of evidence that the Jones Act has resulted in a very cozy monopoly. 
uh, both on the shipping side and on the construction of ships side. And it seems to me that the answer has to, whatever the answer is, it is not that we need to produce all our vessels because obviously um, there are other places that produce them more efficiently, more quickly, and what, more cost effectively, and more with modern technology. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that doesn't mean that it's not relevant for defense because quite obviously in terms of security, having the vessels is more important than where they're built. And if, for, please, for, let's not have any instance where we need them. But if we do need them, uh, the time between the place the orders for the ships and what have you would be so much that you couldn't do it anyway. So I don't think that the shipbuilding capacity because of national security is as important as having the ships. And then I, then I would say we'd do better with uh, those resources. Uh, there's quite, quite a literature on the monopoly effects and their lack of incentives. So I, I think I would dominate with that one. There was another question back over on this side. And then we're coming back down here. Uh, could I interrupt? Oh, sorry. On the, on sorry, the monopoly sorry. issue, uh, Jones Act carriers were charged with monopoly practices in the Puerto Rico trade. And some of them ended up in jail. Uh, right now, there's a proposal to uh, monopolize the service at the port. That is, the cranes that service international and Jones Hack shippers at the port, there's a, a transaction that is, has still not been approved of one of the Jones Hack carriers taking over an independent company and being the only one servicing carriers coming into Puerto Rico. That's the sort of monopolistic pri practice that we are concerned about. A <clears throat> question right there, and then we're coming back over here. Yeah, my, my question, uh, sorry, John Heimlich, Airlines for America. My question has to do with sort of aligning the political lift with the economic benefit. Um, with, and I think of the, Air, the Jones Act in sort of three simple pieces, right? Sort of owned, operated, and built. And it, it tell me if I'm wrong, but my, my sense is that you know, 90 some percent of the economic dislocation is in that where the ship is built provision. In other, in other words, if we lifted that, re reformed that provision, we'd get a lot of economic benefit, even if we still left in place the mandates that the ship vessels had to be owned and operated by U.S. personnel. And that we'd have this influx of vessels that would be have more opportunity for maintenance jobs, sale, uh, you know, marine personnel and whatnot. I mean, if you think about to, and so many people talk about, should we repeal the act? But I think it could be more surgical uh, a discussion. Um, if you think about it today, if, if we sort of replicated the Jones Act for the airline industry, what we're basically saying is you can't fly Airbus equipment, you can't fly Bombardier, you can't fly Embraer, you can only fly Boeing equipment. And yes, there are some Airbus equipment now produced in Alabama. But <clears throat> that aside, Think how many right fewer jobs we'd have if you only allowed vessels made or, or to be more expensive to operate. So I mean, can't we think of this discussion also in terms of sort of honing on on that U.S. built provision? There's a bit of that, uh, as as it has been mentioned in in the Puerto Rico trade and, and also uh, <coughs> very significant for Florida. You allow uh, cruise ships, which are not U.S. owned, not U.S. built, and uh, not U.S. crewed. Now, the exemption requested by the government of Puerto Rico is another step of, you know, nibbling away or opening the door. So uh, while the repeal is best, politically is probably this one step at a time process. And, and I was mentioning before on private conversation that we visualize this a bit, and, and let's keep the distances. We visualize this as the civil rights movement. Uh, we shall overcome. It's not going to happen one day, next tomorrow. It's not going to happen over uh, a year. But there's going to be movement towards the repeal. And yes, it has to be in steps. Yep. And I, if I recall correctly from the uh, one of the studies actually done here at Cato, uh, the operating cost per day of a ship, uh, a U.S. Jones Act shipped, are about three times the cost of operating other ships. 
The shipping, the ship building cost is about six times the other. So the, the, yes, that's part of it, but that's not, the operating cost is still three times that after you take that out. So uh, I, th I think, obviously we would all agree that anything you do to weaken it is good, but on the other hand, I don't think that would solve the problem. Now I promise this gentleman over here for some time and then we'll go over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I just, uh, may, I, may I add a few words? Uh, would, it would be that our petition is precisely predicated on, on the principle that the uh, law, the act provides uh, for this type of, uh, of waiver and that we shall uh, uh, trust that the market forces and the demand created uh, would, would uh, bring the efficiencies and, and it's conditioned on the availability of, of a vessel. In the meantime, while there's no vessel available, then we seek uh, that waiver or, or, or condition. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Rob Cortell, former U.S. Federal Maritime Commissioner. Uh, I have headed a shipbuilding technology company, and I today head a couple of technology companies in the IT space. Um, a couple quick comments and then a question. So to the lady from the EU, um, the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 was, in fact, for the purposes of national security, build a bigger fleet, blah, blah, blah. We can argue about whether that was effective. The answer is it has not been. If you look at the Gulf Wars. The Jones Act is Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act, and only a handful of words that pulls all the worst aspects of that law together. And as he has said up here, it was intended to protect a rail line and a shipping line from Seattle to Alaska from mm -hmm. Chinese and Canadian competition, and it has the effect as intended, which is to destroy international shipping along the coast and cast cargoes into rail and trucks. So that's just the point. That's one point, but for the audience. So it, the Jones Act was not for the purposes of national security. My friend behind me illustrates one of the things that is endemic on the apologists for the law, which is they throw out a lot of chaff, irrelevant stuff. It is true there are 40,000 I wouldn't call them vessels. Calling barges vessels is like calling a bathtub a vessel. Um, <laughs> of the 40,000, 39,000 or so are barges, and yes, they do have a robust trade, um, and they last longer, and, but they're easy to build. Um, and they cannot carry the kinds of cargoes that we really are concerned about, which is deep draft ships. And so what people like to do on the other side is conflate vessels, 40,000 vessels, with problem, which is we don't have enough complex, large ships for LNG, for grain, for anything that requires a big ship, which is real trade. And we only have about 96 of those, and of those, 60-some are tankers. Um, the other thing that they conflate it with is $100 billion worth of economic activity. Well, it is true that the maritime industry as a whole has that much activity, but the Jones Act doesn't. 98% of all, one, less than 1% of everything is Jones Act, um, and everything else, 98% of that is foreign trade. So you could say that of that $100 billion, $98 billion is due to our, thankfully, foreign trading partners who use foreign ships. It has nothing to do with the Jones Act. There may be 10,000 jobs associated with Jones Act facilities, et cetera, but not all the ones you're talking about. And oh, by the way, an American merchant mariner, on average, makes over $120,000 for six months' work. So it's 62 is misleading. So my question is, how are you planning to get past all of this utter BS? Uh, and, you know, LNG is a good case in point. It would take nine months for Crowley to load a single LNG tanker at the rate they load containers. They load what they're called isotainers. Um, for gas. So it's an irrelevant comparison. How, what's your political strategy? Well, we, we uh, and, and thank you for the question. I, I, I must say that we, we have a factually based uh, argument in our petition and we, uh, we certainly uh, hope for, to find uh, proper ground within the, uh, those that are evaluating it. Certainly when you look at the market and how market forces uh, allow efficiencies within it. Crowley and Tote are good examples because now they have ordered LNG-powered uh, uh, vessels. 
So they are taking advantage of it. Please allow us to take the same advantage. Yeah, there's something else about the political strategy. Obviously, if Puerto Rico goes by itself, it, it will not have traction. And the strategy of the government has been to take advantage of the possibility of the northeastern states to benefit from the exemption to the natural gas. So it is a lot of building coalition. At some point, I'm sure the bridges will be made with Hawaii and Alaska. And um, as you know, by our political conditions, we have no uh, voting congressmen, we have no senators, but these states do. So what are you doing about that? Well, I think uh, what's great about our nation is that in terms of politics, we have a cycle. And uh, because of Puerto Ricans, uh, <laughs> Senator Scott is sitting in the Senate. You, you, also, you also have in Florida a lot of cruise ship line operators, all foreign owned, by the way, um, that can't do uh, cruises to nowhere. It's illegal. They can't do cruises to Key West. They can't do a lot. There's a lot of different opportunities that are killed by the Jones Act. And this is, I mean, but, you know, this is inside baseball. This is totally inside baseball. Nobody knows this thing exists. So you got a third of the congressmen for you, you got a third against you, you got a third in the middle, you got to sway one more than the other side. That's <laughs> the political reality. Right over here. Thank you. Um, my question kind of really. Identify yourself, please. Uh, Todd from the House Homeland Security Committee. Um, my question relates to response after, after Maria and Irma. Um, aside from the energy struggles that the, the island has had, how has the Jones Act impacted response and recovery to the hurricanes? Well, um, I would say that when, when we looked at the, uh, the graphic whereby I believe 10 chips took advantage of, uh, of uh, the waiver, the Jones Act waiver. We had a limited um, um, uh, window of uh, just a few days. Uh, you saw energy there, probably half of those. Uh, I think, um, I think uh, we've been served very well by, by, by our chippers uh, in terms of uh, frequency and, and, and and in terms of the ability to bring in goods, uh, but the disruption caused by this incident was uh, truly extraordinary uh, happening in the island. And uh, there was uh, not only a disruption in the ports, but in the roads, and uh, especially in, in a week or 10 days after the storm. So, um, we had uh, logistic issues just within the island that were monumental. So, so we uh, we would like to see this in a in a more on, on a long term uh, solution for 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 the island. But certainly, uh, we work very hard, and we are working with FEMA uh, with. Uh, uh, health uh, agencies, particularly DHS, regarding uh, uh, how we make sure if we have an event similar, uh, like Irma and Maria, we make sure we can stop the suffering, we can allow the flow of goods. Um, that means uh, not only Jones Act, but our, our airports, our airfields, what if we have a major earthquake, what could be the effect on our island condition, bringing in goods are, are certainly uh, a concern that we have, and we are actually working very hard, very hard, the local government with federal agencies, that we make sure we can anticipate and we have readiness, and uh, we harden our assets, including our ports and airports and health facilities. Yeah, you could, you could uh, split in two phases. The first phase that was the t the list that I provided. This is life-saving cargo. I mean, people are dying. There's not enough shipping capacity at one point to, to uh, get this out. And, you know, if uh, the exemption had lasted longer, perhaps fewer people would have died. Now, the other part is once you, you're past that initial crisis, you have FEMA saying, oh, I need this ships to br bring my stuff. Well, 
the total cargo capacity, and this is past the exemption, just shrank. And uh, here is Mr. Manuel Reyes, who had uh, lots of problems with his, the people in his association because shelves were empty. Shelves were empty because there was not enough shipping capacity to bring. And you know who decided what got shipped or not? The shippers. At that point, that was close to being God. I mean, you, you, uh, you couldn't, trans there was not shipping capacity. You would go to one of the shippers and they would decide, okay, I'll ship you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> one of the carriers and they would say, I'll ship you and I wouldn't ship you because there's not enough capacity. So, so those are, uh, that's, you could divide it in that, in that section. Uh, and a final point in regarding the northbound trade, um, because the sh carriers from Puerto Rico go up north empty, that's a huge inefficiency that is passed on on the rates. And so uh, that is reflected in the high shipping rates to Puerto Rico. Okay, John, do you have any last words? No, I'm I think it's time for people to, to leave. <laughs> Alan, do you want to say anything just to wrap up? Okay, well, in that case, let us please thank all three panelists for what's been a very end of the session.